everybody. Uh, I want to start by, if you can see everything here, I want to start by showing this new device that I have, which shows you how far we've come along with technology. This is the thing called the Travis. I use it everywhere and I'll give you an example of what it is. It is really a great pleasure to be with you today. I'm in Switzerland where it's cold. Um grande prazer estar com vocês hoje. Estou na Suíça, onde está frio. Yeah, okay, you could say that's that's not bad, right? <laughs> so, uh, and this is now a device that's inside. It's not a phone. It's connected with a SIM card uh, and everything. So it's basically uh, science fiction is becoming science fact, right? Uh, and that's happening all around us. And uh, this device is not perfect. Uh, in fact, it's it's pretty bad by uh, translating uh, things that are not normal, like like my own name, for example. Um, but in a few years, you can say that basically everybody can speak 50 languages using these devices. And so um, I want to talk today about what it means to, to be a futurist and to help people uh, understand the future in this kind of world, because this is definitely not the same world that 20 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago, it was actually easier to be a futurist uh, because most of the things weren't there. And and today you can think of really uh, far out things and, sci and science fiction things. And, and it seems like they're already here, uh, especially, of course, if you watch shows like Black Mirror and so on. So I'm going to go through this and then hopefully we'll, uh, we'll take some questions at the end. And we're going to distribute the slides, of course, after after the speech. We're also making a video, so hopefully the video will turn out good. Then we can share that, right? So first I want to show you what I do. You know, I work on equal parts on this technology angle, understanding technology. Many of my clients are technology companies, but most of my work is really about bringing the two things together. And it's a constant back and forth. You know, some uh, engagements that I do, I do about a hundred a year, and I speak to people about their future. Some of them are very much about technology. Uh, and less about the human part because there may be a software company or, you know, uh, or the state of Singapore or so. And then we talk about the other things, right? So it's this combination of human things and and uh, technical things. That's kind of my my uh, uh, my cup of tea. And so I call myself a humanist because I'm interested in the human angle. You know, what does it do for people, for for society, uh, for 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 happiness? Uh, I think that that is really the important angle because if it's all about technology, uh, you become a commodity. I mean, basically, technology will be everywhere. It's the most powerful thing in the world today is technology. But, you know, you can't eat technology and you can't uh, make love to computers. Or at least you could try, but uh, it wouldn't turn out well, as, as the movie Her has shown us. So uh, I often get this question about how we deal with all the information, and I think it's really important that we realize that humans are not efficient. You know, I'm not like this. I'm not made from data. I'm not superhuman. And it's great to be faster or more efficient. I work on that a lot. Uh, but ultimately, it's really about this. Right? It's about going back to the uh, to who you really are. That's, that's really the biggest selling factor also if you're thinking about which way you're going to head in the future. In many ways, my work entails a kind of therapy. So uh, I help companies go into the digital tunnel and of course governments, politicians and individuals uh, is to understand all these things that's coming and then basically come up with an approach that is more realistic, more practical than just kind of understanding it, but also creating your future. So I have five keywords for this. I use the word Greek word phronesis, which is practical wisdom. Uh, practical wisdom means we talk about things that may be concepts, but they're always practical. So when I talk about the end of oil or data as the new oil, those, those are practical things, you know, that we have to turn into reality. And I don't work on predictions. I, I think that's probably more unique. I don't think predictions are very valuable in a world that is dramatically changing and pretty much unpredictable. You know, I don't think we can predict the future. Uh, we can only create the future and we can use our foresights to be to be ready for this. But, you know, very few people predicted the Brexit or Donald, Donald Trump or Bolsonaro, right? I mean, we are we are living in a world that's uh, getting more unpredictable, but we can get more foresights and insights and that can help us to develop uh, intuition. I think the most important thing about helping people with the future is intuition. Uh, and this is why I solidly believe that uh, being a futurist is an art. It's not really a science. There's lots of science involved. Uh, if you're so inclined, you could be more scientific. 
But my work is more about uh, feeling it, uh, imagining it, and I've done pretty well the last 15 years. I've, uh, I've had foresights that have realized very quickly. So like in the music business, I talked about music like water uh, in, uh, what was it, uh, 2004. And finally, we have Spotify, which is music like water. I told the car company seven years ago that the main thing about uh, the car business was not to have a car. Uh, and to switch to electric cars and they didn't believe it, but that's what we have. So practical wisdom, foresights, insights. Right? Um, as we're going into the digital tunnel, it's quite clear that much of it will be confusing. I always say, if you're not confused, you're probably not thinking about the future enough. Uh, and I use this approach of saying, this is really my work is very much about the observation. Right? Uh, and to have a future mindset. Right? And I think this is an important thing for our clients. It's not about knowing the future or you know uh, predicting the future. Some people are very good at this, like Ray Kurzweil, of course, Alvin Toffler, Arthur C. Clarke. But this is really about, more for the average person, it's more about the mindset, you know, being open, observing, intuition. I think this is really where our big decisions are coming from. Uh, and it would be wrong if we were to uh, try to prove everything that we may be hearing. You know, we need to just find a way with our imagination. I think that's the most important part. And so as we're going down this road in the future, all the things I'll talk about later, the game changers, you know, artificial intelligence and 3D printing, they're happening faster and faster and faster. It's like going down the highway and you're going at 20 kilometers an hour, like in Brazil, <laughs> going to the airport. And then you go on the German highway, that's 220 kilometers an hour. We're going to go faster and faster and faster. And we have to learn how to navigate this. Uh, this is my mission. It's our mission as people who work in the future. We have to help our, science, our clients see stuff, to understand them, to navigate them, and then ultimately to create. You know, we cannot create the future for our client. Again, this is much like a therapist. You know, a therapist does not tell the couple that they should get divorced. Uh, the couple will find out themselves or they will not. But, you know, you help them navigate, you help them understand. You do not give them recipes, very important. Unless you're like really totally sure that this is the right thing to do. Uh, recipes are almost always wrong because you don't know the whole surrounding part, the cultural part and, you know, all the things. So let's talk about what is foresight, you know. What exactly do I mean by foresight? You know, looking ahead, you know, uh, seeing seeing what's coming rather than what already happened. Right? So uh, foresight is about being open-minded for amazing new things, and of course, reading a lot, studying a lot, constantly reading. I read ten books a month. That's kind of my goal, uh, and of course, lots and lots of RSS feeds and social media, and you know, reading and watching videos. Of course, is crucial. Many films on this topic, uh, documentaries. That is. I try to avoid Hollywood, but uh, take this issue, for example, of uh, artificial meat, you know, basically, well, not artificial, like lab grown meat, you know, this meat is grown in the laboratory. It's a substitute for real meat, but it's made from cows from the cells. Right now it's $2,000 a pound. But when we look at this future, it's quite clear. We have to be critical, but we also have to be open minded well, because these are the stats. So I'm talking about this is a very big topic in Brazil. <laughs> Meat consumption, right? We're going to go to cultured meat. Uh, Bill Gates has invested. Richard Branson has invested. And conventional meat will be around for a long time. But can we afford it with the current global warming scenario? And of course, the, the Amazon is the prime example of why people are uh, eroding everything because they can find places for, for the cattle to grow up and to be produced. So very big consumption. So when we think about this whole idea of, of being a fo having four sets, it's really about open mindedness, but also being able to say, you know, I, I don't think that's going to happen or to be to be critical. My poly called Sa Paul Sappho, who is uh, in San Francisco. He runs an institute there. He always says uh, we should not confuse a good view with a short distance. And so that's something we have to keep in mind. You know, how much, how long will that take? And is it ready? Is it not ready? Very important. Jeff Bezos, uh, founder of Amazon, of course, he used to say all this about algorithms, about data. Basically, he said, everybody needs to bring data when they come and see me, except for God. He can come without data. Uh, and he says, when it comes to really important decisions, it's all about data. But then the other day, he said this, right? He talked about what I call the Android rhythms, the human rhythms, not the algorithms, which is a big topic in my book, chapter four, 
Uh, it's available in Portuguese, of course, you know that. Uh, where Jeff says, all my best decisions in business and life have been made with heart, intuition. Right? So this is an important question for us because this is how we're going to advise clients and, of course, our companies that we're working in. Well, the reality is it's not either or, it's both, right? It's data, science, and it's intuition. Intuition is not data. Intuition is influenced by data, but it's about art, right? So with the Android rhythms are the, the part that is more artistic, and the algorithms is the technological part. We have to mix them, right? We have to use knowledge, but then we also have to use imagination. Uh, this is very important. I mean, the, the Germans are masters of this whole idea of saying that everything is engineered. You know, everything is uh, an algorithm. You know, if it, everything is technology. But in reality, that's not the case. It's always a mix of those two things. Right? So that's a very important learning, I think, from the 15 years I've been doing this. And, of course, there's no such thing as a right brain, left brain. There's no such thing as saying, you know, I work with logic or data or I don't. Uh, it's all one thing with humans. Computers are different. Computers have logic, they don't have emotion, they don't have existence. Very important to realize for us that we're always thinking with everything. Many psychologists are saying we're thinking with the body, not with the brain. The brain is plastic, it could do many different things. There is no right brain, left brain <laughs> in the traditional sense. So when we talk about foresights, very important, and this is very hard for companies that I work with, uh, they work in hindsight, so they experience trouble. They look back and say, oh, we have to change. And that's how they get insights. But we have to actually do it like this. The past is the past. We have to learn from it. The present is the present. But the future will be entirely different. It's not an extension of the present. You know, in 10 years, it's going to be the end of oil. Uh, we're going to shift to entirely new energy. What is that going to mean for Brazil and for other countries that are kind of oil dependent? Uh, we're going to have a different future. We have to invent that future, not from the present, but starting with the future. Right? So asking the questions, what if, you know, what happens when oil declines? And, and we see all these things, you know, about foresights. We have to actually have different windows. We have today, we have to do today well, and that's often my job as well, is to help companies today and governments, of course. And then there's tomorrow, which is going to be quite, quite different. Right? There's... And we have to make a difference. We have to be able to think of those things at like a hybrid effort, you know, today and tomorrow at the same time. And this is a very particular uh, skill for futurists and for the work that I do. You have to be able to understand why it's important to perform today and to make things more efficient and so on. And then there's a future which is completely different. And to explain that to people, you know, sometimes that's pretty hard because uh, they're not used to thinking of two levels at the same time. That's more what musicians do or artists do. So uh, the other important thing is that we need to think about giving hope to our clients. That we are in a situation that is significant future shock, especially in Brazil. Right? And this is also increasing exponentially. I mean, we have climate change being a shock. We have automation. The robots are coming. Geopolitical things, neo-populism, neo-Nazism. I mean, we have a lot of things happening. Right? So many people are worried about the future. And you could say that we have good reasons to worry, but I, th I take it the other way around. I'm like, I, th I think we're also solving many, many things. Yeah, the only thing we need to do right, is when we think about the future shock, we have, I always say the future is better than we think. We need governance, right? We need to work together to solve them because you know technology will solve so many things if we apply it correctly. And that's the human part. Technology doesn't solve anything by itself. This is really what we need to do. Here's a chart from World Economic Forum. If you look at this chart, it's funny. You can say, well, you know, whatever you believe in, it could be really bad, it could be really good. <laughs> so on the left hand is the positive things. You can download that later. Uh, the red one is the uh, not, not so good things. And for example, if you look at uh, artificial intelligence, it's actually in both sides, you know, advances in AI. It, it's both on the left side, the good side, and the negative side, right? So I always say it could be heaven or could be hell. It's really up to us to decide uh, te because technology doesn't make moral, ethical, value decisions. Eh? So the future is better than we think. It's about governance. And this goes for companies, goes for cities, goes for states and countries. And of course, you know, in 20 years, I think we all agree it's quite likely we'll have a world government in 20 years. Uh, because, you know, as you can see with Bolsonaro on the Amazon, uh, you know, there are many countries who are now worried about the Amazon, even though it doesn't belong to them. 
<laughs> they have no control over it. These are global issues. So we have to govern wisely. I'll, I'll get back to this in a second and we can discuss some more of that too. The other thing is when we think about the future, we always have to think about culture and mindset. If our client has a different culture that is top down and centralized, or it's a family company where it's only one person in their seventies deciding what the company should be doing, or of course politics, you know, this is really what, I mean, I think Peter Drucker once said, a strategy eats technology for breakfast. And I always say, you know, culture eats technology for breakfast. Do not make a change with technology when the culture isn't there. Uh, that usually ends very badly. So we have to think to keep this in mind and say, okay, it's, it's a large ecosystem of different things. And every client is different. This is why it's so hard to give a recipe. And I prefer to have my clients discover their own recipe again, like a therapist. And that's a much healthier approach because it's not quite as uh, uh, a tall order to actually realize this. Brings me to the last point on this. Uh, how do we actually change people and, gov and governments and our companies? Well, we don't change just because we want to change. There has to be a reason. I mean, human change factors are pain and love. That's it. We change because we have pain. Uh, we realize all of a sudden, you know, we're lonely or we're, we're left in the dark to dry or we lost all of our revenue streams. Uh, our business has gone away, uh, you know, and then and then we say, OK, you know, it's over so I can do something else. Right. And then we fall in love with people, with ideas, with uh, concepts. Right. And and those two things are the biggest change factor. If your company isn't changing, maybe they don't have enough pain yet. So you have to give them some pain. Uh, but most importantly, you have to make them fall in love with a new idea, you know, introduce a new concept. Right? And this is, of course, in Brazil, this is very clear is when I teach in Brazil and do seminars, it's, you know, when people are in love with an idea, it usually happens very quickly. Right? So pain is a not very good long term change factor. It's, it's just sort of a catalyst, you know, much better for us to, to find new things and say, how about this, you know, would this be something that you can feel excited about? So uh, some context as to the future, uh, some a few more technical things, but I will not go greatly into this because I'm sure you've covered most of this in the other stuff. Chapter three in my book, if, uh, if you have my book, otherwise you can download this entire chapter for free, megashifts.digital. Um, it's on the internet and it's also in Portuguese. And if you don't speak Portuguese, maybe you speak Spanish or English or Russian or Chinese, it's in 10 different languages there. Megashifts.digital. You should read that first, really, as, as, as a way to get into the book. And when people talk about digital transformation, especially in Brazil, they're usually very much like recipe and formula oriented. But the reality is that transformation is like a moving map, right? Like this. I call it the mega shifts. And I did this three years ago, and it's constantly changing now. So we have so many things happening at the same time. And as a futurist, you really have to understand all of them, whether it's about robotization, about disintermediation, like in retail, about, about personalization and cognification, which is smart systems. Uh, and this is really the nuts and bolts of sort of the new way of understanding business uh, and, of course, society and, and governance as well. Uh, I'm not going to get into much into that because you can easily read that later. But suffice to say, that is something that's really important for our background. So in this world where we're heading and consider yourself lucky because I guarantee you every company, every state, every city, every governor, every politician will need a futurist to help them, a therapist, a future therapist, because, you know, we're talking about the biggest technological transformation in human history, where our body is changing, our genome can be changed, our head can be connected to AI. I mean, we're talking about, yeah, 10 years, it's basically unlimited, 20 years, totally unlimited, and 2050, the convergence of what technology and humans can do, literally uh, bringing us together in what's been called the singularity, um, which I'm not a great fan of, but we'll discuss that later. Um, so really what's happening here is that, you know, this is the, what I call the future principle, the first three, part of my next book. The model of the future is exponential, is all going like this, right? Uh, Moore's law, Metcalfe's law. The industries are converging, Banking is technology, media is technology, transportation is technology, government is technology, right? And it's combining all different parts of this uh, powerful sciences, you know, like the cloud and, 
and, and quantum computing and the mobile, they're all coming together. We have to understand this because this is not just going to be a, a, a small process, and especially not in, con in countries that are not as far developed as, say, Germany or so, where it's already quite mature, there will be leaps. You know, all of a sudden, new things become possible and new questions will be asked. You know? And we have to be able to understand and, and see their consequences. You know? So uh, print this out and put it on your wall. Uh, this is basically what's happening all around us in healthcare and banking. It's, con it's converging, it's combinatorial, it's extremely powerful. 4, 8, 16, 32, right? Not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, not linear. So give you an example of the exponential thinking. Very hard for humans to understand because we are not exponential. We are limited uh, by our biology. We are organic. That is a great advantage, but for thinking it makes it hard. 30 steps from here, I guess across the living room and 30 steps up exponentially, I go to the moon. Right? Metcalfe's law, the power of networks. Right? This is Facebook, for example. Every user multiplies the whole system by two. This is why we have this powerful network effect of the international uh, platform companies, which have to be regulated because they're becoming more powerful. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg is essentially the global president today, which I'm quite worried about. <laughs> so. The principle of the future is gradually, then suddenly. So in other words, you don't see much and then everything is ready and everything is reaching the takeoff point like electric cars, like like telebanking, uh, like telepresence, like like all these things that are 3D printing. You don't see much and all of a sudden, boom, it's there. Like Spotify, all of a sudden, people are paying $10 a month. In many, I think it's a little bit less in Brazil. Um, for Spotify, it's 120 million subscribers. Right? It's basically exploded. Very important to realize this, especially for businesses. We don't have a lot of time to observe. We have to understand when the takeoff happens. And here is our challenge. We are not exponential, but technology is surpassing us in power. Roughly 10 years for that to really happen. We can speak to computers. We can command computers. We can rely on computers for important information. Uh, computers are making decisions for us. They can see us. They can understand us. Can they think? No, they can't think, <laughs> but they can calculate and they can compute, not think like a human, right? but, but we are not. right? So really what's happening here is that uh, machine smartness will be everywhere. But to be a smart human, uh, that is almost impossible for a machine. I would say it may be possible in 30, 40 years. Uh, it's, it's, it's thinkable, but for the time being, this is what we do. right? We are more human, so it becomes much more important for us uh, to be more human and to have the skills that humans have, which are on the opposite side of the spectrum. Here are the game changes. You can download that later. Uh, again, I won't talk about it very much. This is more like technical. So these are the nine things that are changing every single company and government and organization. Uh, the cloud, smart computing, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, the blockchain, 3D, uh, augmented reality, and human genome editing. That's the last one, become anything. And those are the driving forces. So if you haven't looked at that background, you should, because that's basically the background information to why everything is changing. Uh, and I, I don't think there's any, any real way for us to go back and say, we, would, we don't want this. Yeah, there's, there's really just only a way of, of orchestrating it and putting it in the right place. You know, Quantum computing is a great example which is 3D computing. Um, that's being invented everywhere. And basically, it means a computer has the, the, the computing power a million times of what we have now. Like this mobile phone would be in 10 years, roughly uh, yeah, 5 million X in computing power in the cloud, of course, right? And six weeks of battery. So we have to understand that background is important. So I want to get back to the other topic about what we actually do as futurists and, and which where we're heading with this. Um, I think that is really the important part. I call this a new renaissance. Okay? Um, and you know the renaissance from the 1500s in Italy, which led to the, to the Enlightenment and then to the, to the Reformation. You know, it was primarily based on the thinking that uh, the most important thing in life is no longer the Pope or God, it's the humans. <laughs> and that happened in the 1500s. And I think now we're having another renaissance where we go from this idea of, you know, technology being so important in many ways, you could say technology has become the new God. You know, I'm, I'm not religious, so 
sorry if I step on your toes there, but uh, technology is the most powerful. People pray to technology or they love technology. And now digital transformation is everywhere. And this is a part of this whole discussion that, you know, this transformation has led in many cases to what I call dehumanization, which is uh, essentially things are no longer as human as they should be. And machines are taken over and we have this also unemployment because of automation of call centers and driving. And that is now being rethought. The last two years have brought this topic, which is a big part of my, of my book, of, of ethics. You know, what do we really want from technology? And I think now we're looking at places like Singapore or Denmark or many others where co countries are saying, you know what, it's not just about having amazing technology. We have to have human purpose. We have to be happy. You know, we have to find a way to do this. And I call this a new renaissance. This is one of my new speaking topics for next year. Uh, to where we're reorienting towards what it means to be well as a human rather than to be well equipped with technology. Right? Uh, and this also helps with this discussion. I'm sure you've seen this around. I use this quite a bit. But, you know, this is so many people are thinking, okay, we're going to be useless humans because technology can do everything. And so you would say, yeah, technology can do bookkeeping. Technology can do financial advice. Technology can even fix your teeth. Technology can operate, technology can scan for melanomas. I mean, it can do everything, right? But it can't do it like a human. So I, I think we're not going to be useless. We're going to be different. Uh, we're going to have less routine work because technology does the routine. And I think this is really important. It's the end of routine could be at the end of the job if your job is totally routine, like a supermarket. Check out the supermarket or the call center. But, you know, you also have 21 million jobs in social media now that didn't exist just 10 years ago. And so new jobs are being made all the time. For example, I think when, when Brazil goes away from fossil fuel and, and oil and gas and, and coal, you know, the next wave of green energy will, will create worldwide, it has been said, 100 million new jobs in green energy. So I don't think we'll be useless. You know, we have to be prepared. This is very important for education. You can see on this chart here, when AI comes in, you know, I, I always say artificial intelligence, AI. When AI meets HI, human intelligence, you know, then it's basically all upside down. And you can see here on this, on, on this slide, uh, on the lower part, manufacturing, transportation, those jobs are declining because machines can do them. Right? Construction even building, you know, 3D printing of houses. But on the top end, they're increasing. So more healthcare jobs, more scientific jobs, technical jobs, more communications, more futurists. <laughs> I mean, anything that's a soft skill will increase. If you have kids, this is what they have to learn. Right? Hard skills are always good, but they can be automated. I mean, computers are good at hard skills, you know, basically learning how to reproduce and to simulate. But we are much better at soft skills. This is very important that we also teach our kids at, at, you know, to create their future jobs and to look in this direction. So our ultimate job is to be human. I mean, this is a job that machines will never reach unless we teach them and allow them and engineer them to be like humans, which we should not do. And anyway, that's 30 or 40 years away, even the possibility because we don't really understand how we are uh, in terms of computing <laughs> and biology. So basically our ultimate job is to do what we can do best, right? Imagination, design, understanding, negotiation, uh, intuition, foresight, storytelling, narratives. Yeah, you know, very hard for a computer. Uh, that's called the Moravec paradox. Moravec was a famous uh, futurist in uh, Eastern Europe and a scientist. I think he's actually still alive. And he, uh, he once said that basically whatever is simple for a computer is hard for a human, and what is simple for a human is hard for a computer. I think that's going to be true, hopefully, for quite some time, at least 30 years. Uh, and we'd, we wouldn't want to touch that. That's my personal view, that we, we wouldn't want to the computer, the machine, to become too much like us. That could end very badly for us. <laughs> you know, Elon Musk and, and Stephen Hawking have talked about this. So what makes us human? Well, we have eight or 10 or 12, some scientists say, researchers say, different kinds of intelligence. 
Uh, emotional intelligence, for example, is very hard to define. Lots of research on this shows, by the way, that women have a lot more emotional intelligence than men. So many people are saying women are much better suited for the future because these skills will be needed because they're different than, than robots. Right? I mean, if you think like a robot, you work like a robot, a robot will take your job. Right? And if it's just about being smart and fast, uh, the robot will beat you. And currently that's not really the case, but give it five years, 10 years, the computer will speak, it will see, it will discuss, it will debate, it will, you know, you can even marry a robot. You can already do that, but uh, this will become in many ways a proposition. Huh? So you're going to get to places where robots can do all these things, but do they have a really kinesthetic, you know, the body? Do they have social intelligence, musical intelligence? And so we are much, much ahead of machines here. And I would say at this point, compared a bit to like the most fanciest uh, camera in the iPhone, the iPhone 11, right? uh, I've, I've read a report the other day that even the fanciest camera you can buy in a mobile phone like the iPhone 11 or so, it still only captures less than 1% of what your eye is capable of ca capturing and your memory. Right? It's far removed from, from, uh, from being the same. Right? It's just the tool that we use. Yeah? It's still very good, obviously. I have one. So our mission is this. right? We have to help our companies to rehumanize and by using technology. Right? We have to think about this as a new era of futurism, where it's no longer going to be about saying, oh God, look at this amazing tool, you know, buy the software package or, you know, all those, all those things that we used to do, which is to praise technology and to help people understand technology. That's all good. But now we have to go a step further. We have to say, okay, there's a new era coming where it's about people and where value is created with people. That brings me to one of my last chapters here, and then we'll take some questions. I know there's lots of material here, but you, you'll get the PDF and the video. You can watch it again, and you can use the device to translate. So uh, new paradigms. Yeah? We have the biggest paradigm changer right now, and this is, in my view, now getting to a really, really difficult place. Not good news, especially not for Brazil, but pretty much for any country that has large uh, uh, nature surroundings. I mean, CO2 is going up. Look at all the stuff that is going up. It's China, the US, and, and, and Asia, right? And Europe is declining. Uh, greenhouse emissions from agricultural production of beef, very big problem. And this is why the Dutch government is now trying to do away with beef. And this uh, slide here is the most depressing. Um, <clears throat> there's foresight, basically, research shown that if we go up as it looks like right now, we're going to continue going up with the CO2 and the PPMs and basically the amount of global warming. When it goes to four degrees or five on a global level, all of the southern hemisphere will be in deep trouble. Because basically we're looking at desertification, we're looking at climate refugees. I mean, look at Africa and the Middle East and basically uninhabitable you know, at five degrees extra. And we're talking about sea level rise of not just two meters like Venice right now. We're talking about 50 meters, right? So the Northern Hemisphere is uh, less touched by this, of course, even though for other reasons they are. But look at Brazil, that's not at the very top there, but yeah, it's not looking pretty. Um, so that's the 50 year horizon. We're talking about 200 million climate refugees. So. When we take this, we can say what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see dramatic CO2 regulation. And this will be mandatory from the UN, just like nuclear weapons. We're going to see CO2 like uh, shutting down coal plants, uh, CO2 tax on flying airplanes, pro pro prohibition of cars in cities, CO2 carbon tax pretty much everywhere, including meat. Hard to imagine in Brazil, yeah, I know. But we've seen that already happening in Europe, right? EasyJet just announced mandatory CO2. Uh, KLM announced that uh, other airlines are following suit. Some airlines are saying we shouldn't fly, we should take the train. I mean, this is all happening already, right? And the switch to electric cars. China has banned the traditional mopeds, you know, the gas engine mopeds with electric ones has replaced them now. And so we're going to see dramatic, dramatic regulation. This is a great opportunity for us as futurists to contribute. Finally, you know, 20 years ago, I tried this. Nobody was interested. Uh, yeah, but huge paradigm shift. The second one that goes here, 
And this is why it's important that we talk about climate change, because it's a trigger. Right? The second one is human change. Right? How technology changes us. Exponential technological change makes us forget ourselves, uh, gets us addicted, the robot takes over uh, our thinking. Uh, it's not coming to kill us quite yet, but yeah, technology is also one of those things that's kind of like digital pollution. Also very, very big problem in, in Brazil, you know, the addiction to mobile devices, Facebook, Instagram. And how do we regulate this? I don't know, we can regulate this, right? but clearly, this is the paradigm that I've been proposing in my book, and I explain a little bit more detail here. This is the new future, the Renaissance paradigm, to where we think, okay, a company must have holistic business models, must all benefit everyone. It must have a circular logic, sustainable, recycling, bringing things back into the system, and it must create human benefits. So the three bottom lines, three human future principles, right? holistic, people, planet, purpose, prosperity, circular economic, economics and the focus on human benefit. You can bet on this becoming the new, the new normal. I know it's hard to believe today because many companies are doing exactly the opposite and many countries like, like the US also doing exactly the opposite. But I think, you know, we can see this, the business roundtable in the US, uh, the top 200 CEOs of US companies have said the future is not about stake, shareholder value anymore. It's about stakeholder value. Stakeholder, people, planet. Uh, vendors, partners, humans, employees. Uh, and they're making some very big noise about making some fundamental changes to, to the stock market. So I think we're going to see a new stock market model here. Uh, I have described this several times in, in this paradigm of people, planet, purpose, and prosperity. I can guarantee you there's a five-year window is to not pay attention to this. Uh, all other companies in the world that are making that switch are ready to create a wider angle. Uh, I call this sustainable capitalism. It's not socialism, <laughs> even though it may sometimes sound like it, right? But it's basically a way of keeping our economic system sustainable. So that is something that we need to take a lead in and help companies understand why that's important. So I'll, I'll finish off with the ethics uh, part. Uh, it's quite clear that technology is the governing force of society and also the major money maker now. But technology has no ethics. Computers don't understand feelings. They may understand our feelings, but they have no feelings. Right? It's quite a difference between reading emotion in a human and having emotion. You know, that's not at all the same thing. So when we're you know, seeing a computer that reads us, then it, it doesn't actually feel anything. You know? It doesn't have any agenda. It, it just doesn't care. So this is very important for us. And if we define ethics, as knowing the difference between what you have a right to do and to know what is the right thing to do, that's ethics. Right? And it's becoming more important than ever before because now technology is becoming so powerful uh, that it's really all about that handshake. Right? It's all about, are we gonna collaborate or are we gonna become you know, uh, enemies of technology? Are we gonna compete with technology, which we can't win? Right? So key topic, I think every country, every state, every city, you know, Rio de Janeiro is working very hard on their, on their status of this whole idea of, of positive technology. Uh, Lisbon, Barcelona, Copenhagen. Yeah, it's a global discussion that we see everywhere. Because, you know, now we're at the takeoff point on this curve. Again, consider yourself lucky because you're, you're not down there where nothing is moving. You're actually at the knee of the curve, the takeoff curve. So now it's 4, 8, 16, 32 and so on. And so now the old question of saying, you know, does technology work? How does it do it? And, you know, all of those practical things, you know, that is going to be replaced in the very near future by the why question. Why are we doing this? Who is doing it? Can we trust them? And that's where value is going to be created. So we have five more years to sort of close the window on the old way of thinking. Uh, and this is happening very quickly in, in Europe. We're only two years away from this. Uh, of understanding why you know th this is the major issue. That's why the European Commission has had so many attempts at breaking up tech com companies and, and and leveraging fines and the GDPR and you know all of those things that we see here. So a good move would be in Brazil. I think you know this has already been instigated in many ways, and I've talked about this for ten years. But we need to have a council of the wise people, 
I'm mean, talking about the really wise people, not not the futurists, <laughs> even though there are some that can be really wise, but the kind of Aristotle kind of people, Socrates kind of people, you know, who are going to think about what we should do with technology. Should we change the genome of our baby so it will not get sick? Or should we change it so it can be 150 years old when it gets older? Right? I mean, those are all very big issues. Right? Every large organization, every company, every city will have an ethics officer, a person deciding what to do with technology and what not. In fact, I think many of us will end up with this job right? to find a balance between those things, to have a, a broader view. So that, that's definitely coming. I can see that happening everywhere. Final thoughts. Um, we are on a trajectory to where we can no longer be human roughly in 20 years. Uh, it is possible for us to connect our brain to the internet. Now we're connecting our mobile phone. Very soon we connect the glasses and then we connect the neural lace. Elon Musk, you know, the brain computer interface. We have to decide how far you want to take this. It's not a technical question. Uh, if it takes 20 years or 30 years or 50 years, it's not going to take 500 years. And then the question is, okay, what do we want? Do we want to become a hybrid? Is that a good thing? Who's going to be in charge? Who can afford it? Are we going to have more equality if I can live to be 150 and everybody else just lives to be 60 because they, you know, they don't have the financial wherewithal? Right? It's very important. You know, Marshall McLuhan, uh, one of the most favorite uh, futurists, uh, even though he didn't use that word, I don't think, but you know Marshall McLuhan, I hope, right? He did say that basically all extensions of man, all the extra stuff that we do, they also amputate things like our feelings, being in touch with ourselves and so on. And, and this is a very, very difficult uh, decision to make. That's one that the state also has to make. So say, is it going to be illegal or not? Uh, that's a very big question for our future. Tim Cook, who I greatly admire, the CEO of Apple, in his positioning of Apple, you know, Apple has become so successful also because Apple is probably the only tech company that goes very heavy on privacy. And also that's why I'm an Apple user. But he said in a conference where I was actually speaking in the afternoon, he said technology can do great things, but it does not want to do great things. It doesn't want anything. And to remain human, we're going to have technology uh, to tell technology what we want. And we have to limit technology and we have to protect what makes us human. So this is also very important for our clients. You know, it's the, the key to our future is not just technology. That will be like saying the key to a carpenter's career is the hammer. You know, it's not. It's his, his mind and his understanding and his, his uh, wishes, right? Because basically machines don't do any of the stuff that's really important to us. Machines don't do relationships and they certainly don't do any of this. And ultimately, I can tell you, this is what your clients want from you. Right? They want to understand the purpose. They want to get curious. They want to see foresights. Yeah, these are human things, character skills. I mean, basically, if you tell clients about technical solutions, they they will appreciate that because it's useful, right? But really, in the end, it's about larger things. And, and at least that's how I look at my work is to help them unlock imagination, find purpose and those kind of things. Right? And then lastly, the, um, <clears throat> the issue of what we do as futurists, many people think that the world is like yes or no. Like AI is good, AI is bad, robots are good, robots are bad, but it's actually not like this, it's more like this, at where we are uh, essentially always in a mix between those answers. It always depends. Right? And there's two paradigms. One is the sort of proactive paradigm, which is going to do pretty much anything, right, and courageous. And the other paradigm is more uh, basically uh, keeping values, right? It's more what's called the cautionary approach. Right? And we have to combine the two. Uh, John McCarthy, the AI guy, was more on the cautionary approach. He said we shouldn't do that because it could end up badly, and other ones were not. So this is something we have to think about. You know how we're going to combine all the things that are possible in good ways and in bad ways, and that that is definitely an art. I'll leave you with a final scene from my upcoming book. Um, which uh, well, upcoming is going to be at least a year. <laughs> so the six future principles, the top three ones we talked about earlier, you have to understand this. Uh, you have to understand what it means and the progress and the exponential change because that's the driving force behind everything. Right? But that's really more, you know, technology uh, and science. And here's the 
the human things that we have to understand that we have to have holistic business models we have to stop uh, inequality we have to decrease poverty even more that's been a, a big discussion of course in brazil uh, we have to respect, respect our planet we have to switch to a circular economy all very large opportunities so you know there's lots and lots of new ways of of, uh, of, of initiatives and also of jobs and, and then end up with a human focus not a technology focus that's why i call it the new renaissance you know going away from saying you know it's all important that it's so efficient and fast and cheap and you know that we can order a pizza and it comes with a robot and whatever it is right yeah we need to have human benefit which includes interaction relationships engagement uh, not not machines so i want to thank you for your time i know this was a lot of stuff you probably written down 500 questions and uh, let's switch to discussion mode huh